Los Angeles is a weird place. It's a it's a very I'll, I'll say unique place. That's a nice way to put it. It's a uh, I spent almost a full decade there. Not exactly a full decade, but like nine and a half years, and I have mixed feelings about it. I um I went there like full of hope, and I got to do some really cool things. I mean, i like a lot of you know me from the church, which is great. And, and that was fun, but uh, and I spoke about this on other episodes. But I, I went there, I moved there to work on, uh, well, I, I, mo- I was going to say to work on reality TV. I, w- I went there to be a, an editor. Um, and I don't even, to be honest, know if like I was ever, if I ever thought I'd be like a movie editor, but like TV, even commercials would have been cool. Um, and I, I, I did it for about three years, and I, I, I didn't, I never made it to full editor. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it starts off. You, most people start off as a PA, but that's not even really related to editing at all. And then you move on to assistant editor. Um, you could also be a digitizer before that, but I, I was never a digitizer, uh, which is is just basically getting the the footage into the system, which is what a lot of assistant editors do. But for even a bit, like one of the biggest shows I worked on. Um, Hell's Kitchen, there were people who just digitized the entire time. Um, but I did it for like three, three and a half years. I, uh, I worked, like I said, I worked on Hell's Kitchen. I worked on uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. I worked on the Caesar Milan show. I worked on a lot of shitty shows too. Um, and that was, um, again, sort of like LA was mixed. It was very exciting. I remember the first time. I even have a screenshot of it. Uh, I I remember the first time I saw my name on in the credits on a TV show. That was for America's Funniest Home Videos, and it was an amazing feeling. That was one of the coolest things that ever happened to me. Um, I got to meet some great people, uh, and not even like talent wise. Although I did get to meet like a uh, Tom Bergeron, and and uh, as you'll hear in here, I, I met. Uh, one of the guys, uh, the guy who played Dr. Cox, very briefly, I don't even, I, 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 it's more like I saw him, I don't know if we, we would say we met, um, I made some great friends uh, who, working there, um, some, one of my very early mentors, unfortunately passed away, but his name was Chris, uh, Matt, Wayne, actually has also passed away, um, it's, that's one of the weird things, that has nothing related to uh LA, but it is weird as an adult. You start, you meet these people, and and they start, uh, they start passing away. It's a very sad thing, but it's not where I wanted. It's not. Uh, this is not a bummer of a podcast. Um, it's supposed to be kind of funny. I, I'm, I won't. In thinking of LA, which is like I said, it's a very unique place, and it a, a certain type of person moves to LA. Now, you don't have to be in the entertainment industry to move to L.A., and there's plenty of people who were born in California, and there's people who just moved to L.A. because they think it's cool, uh, they like the beach, uh, maybe they're an athlete, but a large percentage of the population is uh, not from L.A. or California and is there specifically to be a star. Um, you like the hand thing I just did? Be a star. Uh, and, and including myself, but not at all in front of the camera, which is still blows my mind that I, I do this now because I had no interest in it. I was always very shy and, uh, and I enjoy, I very much enjoyed the editing process. Um, I used to say, and it's just the truth because I wasn't, I'm not good at building anything with my hands. Ikea it should be Lee can't build you. That should be the new name of IKEA. Lee Lee can't build you. Um, I I'm awful. I can't. I one time I tried to hang a shelf, and my neighbors came and knocked on the on my door because like you're making a lot of noise. And then even even the shelf like there were like 18 holes in the wall. It it didn't sit flush. It was at an end. if I put anything on it, it would just roll off. I'm not I'm I'm not the type of person who who can install anything more than like a battery and even then it's going to be rough if there's like a screw involved but the thing that I enjoyed about editing is that in as 
to me, I'm not, I was going to say similar. It's not similar at all. But to me, the thing I enjoyed about editing was I, I would sit, you'd sit down and there'd be a whole, there'd be a ton of footage and you would take nothing and turn it into something and like watch that process of it being built. And it was very, it was, um, fulfilling. Is that the word? Satisfying. Um, both of those things. It was just really cool. And even though, the, like I said, I, I was an assistant editor, but I was part of that process. So I, I really enjoyed it, but I, to me, and I, this isn't LA's fault, but I'm not good at making friends. Um, I, to be honest, I didn't, I, I interned in LA before, like the summer before I moved out there. And I, uh, even in talking with my future, like not my, uh, my head on boss, but the guy who owned the company, I told him, well, I went to thank him and he was great. He, Vin DeBona is one of the nicest people in the world. Uh, I hope he sees this. I know he won't, but uh, I just want to put it out there that he is a, a, an amazing human being and uh, helped me immensely. And I told him in our like end of internship meeting, like, thank you. I loved it. Everyone was great here, which they are. Um, but I think I like New York better than L.A. I feel like more of a New York person. But he, they said him and then Sharon, my boss, my like immediate boss, was like, if you want to come back, you're always welcome. Uh, when you graduate, and uh, I, uh, that really, in a weird way, is why I went out to L.A., because, I mean, having a job, like, immediately after college, like, I left within a week of graduating college, I moved to L.A., and not very many people have that, so I felt blessed, and I just got in the car, to be honest, I don't even think I told them, I think I called on the way, I was like, I'm coming, um, I think I told her that I was pro- I was going to come before, but then like I didn't really follow up, and I just I remember I I th- I literally remember I think I had just gotten Wendy's and I called. I was like I'm coming. She I think she even emailed me or something. Like are you coming soon or, um, and I to me I treated L A like a business trip. I I should have gotten roommates when I moved there, um, but I didn't. I didn't like roommate. I, I had bad uh, experiences with with roommates in college. So I just wanted to live by myself, and I I made some great friends, like I said at Vindabona. Um, but the problem with LA is, it's you're so far separated that it's sort of hard. And by the way, something I don't know if you guys, uh, if any of you are younger out there who and are still in school, it was hard for me. I remember the first uh, little bit after I started working. And granted, I did go back and forth between nights and days, so that had something to do with it. But I was working from 10 to 7, and I had to leave by 8.30 at the latest in the morning to get there. And then I wouldn't get home until 8, 8.30 at night. So I like the, the idea of going out after was like not even considered uh, when I first got there. Um, but I I treated it like a business trip. I'm not a beach person, obviously. Like, look, I'm. I have to turn this light down to like the lowest possible setting because I'm white enough as it is. I look like a ghost. I look like the chubbiest ghost ever. Um, I'm not an outdoors person. Uh, the the thing I like most about L.A. is uh, the stand up comedy. As a fan, is amazing. The store, the fact, the Laugh Factory, the improv. All amazing uh, venues. The Ice House, of course. Um, and the other thing, and we'll talk about it in here a little bit. Because on, honestly, my favorite place in LA, and I'm, I'm very bummed that I didn't get to go there for like the last year and a half I was there, was, uh, it's called the New Beverly Cinema. And it's on, I believe it's even on Beverly Boulevard. Um, it's right it's sort of like I don't really even really know what you would even call this area of town. I think it's called Beverly. Um, Beverly Glen. No, that's a street Beverly Glen. But it's not quite Santa Monica. It's not Hollywood. I don't really know. It's in the Jewish section, to be honest. Um, and I say that because the you'd, there no there's no parking on the street or very little. But on the side streets nearby, there would be. And I'd go there a lot on the weekends, Friday nights. 
and you'd see all the Hasidic Jews walk in a temple. Um, that's something weird about L.A. you don't think about is uh, then there and then Chandler in the Valley. There's a, a street. If you like the office, um, you'll see them. A lot of times they're driving is on Chandler. Yeah, you'll recognize it if you're from L.A. or live in L.A. Um, but the the Jews live on Chandler, heavy, um, and they're, they're walking all over the place. But um, what I wanted to really talk about today are some of like the weirdest L.A. things that happened to me. And that's really it's going to be a short episode. I don't. Uh, I just. Um, I'm. I went to Austin last week, and then this week I'm in uh, Milwaukee doing some consulting, and I'm not getting back until midnight, like on I guess Tuesday morning. So I wanted to make sure you guys had an episode. So I'm recording this. If you look back, it's the same shirt as last week, because I'm recording it like three hours later. I uh, I just wanted to make sure you guys had an episode. I do want to thank. Uh, also, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. And I want to thank Manscaped. And I have very exciting news for you. Manscaped has a brand new product out. New product alert. New product alert. I don't have a uh, like a siren uh, sound effect, but I'd put it in if I had it. They have something very cool that's called the Ultra Smooth Package. It's a specialized groom shave. Uh, I'm sorry, a groin shaving kit. To help you buff, protect, and smooth your most sensitive areas. And they're called the Crop Shaver, Crop Exfoliator, and the Crop Gel. It's time to crop that bush of yours and get right to the roots with a discount just for you. You get 20% off with free shipping when you enter code SYAT, S-Y-A-T-T, at manscaped.com. Just want to show you, I have the smooth package right here. The ultra smooth package. Forget smooth. It's ultra smooth. Your balls are going to be softer than... I was going to say baby's bottom, but that's kind of weird. Uh, how about this? It's going to be softer than those, you know, those like super soft. I don't even know if they're suede, but like those soft blankets that they, they like you just rub against your face and it just feels like heaven. It's going to be like a cloud. Your balls are going to be like cl- two pillowy clouds with the ultra smooth package. They have the crop exfoliator, which helps pre- prevent irritation when you're shaving. And it nourishes the skin as well. They have the crop gel, which lubricates and moisturizes. And it's it's what you put on while you're shaving. Then they have the crop shaver, which is a three-blade cartridge razor, razor with a lubricated skin bars. Okay? You get all three of these things when you go to manscaped.com and use code SCIENT. You're going to get 20% off plus free shipping. So go to manscaped.com, use code SCIENT. To get 20% off plus free shipping. Smooth it out, fellas, with Manscaped, your balls, and Lee. I will thank you because you're supporting the people who support me. Okay. So, the weirdness of L.A. started even before I got to L.A. I might have told this story before, but I, I, I was buying my computer for college. And I was I went to the... This is when you had to go to the store to get them. Um, I went to the Apple store... I think in either Natick or Burlington, Massachusetts. I forget. And I, I the guy who was helping us, uh, he was asking about what I was doing. And I told him I was going to Emerson to, to edit. And he said, oh, I was an assistant editor. And he said he worked on like the OC. And he worked on some big shows. Like, And now I know. I didn't even know back then. To work on um, scripted network television is huge but I had no idea and to me the fact that he was back working in the Apple store freaked me out I was like because I as a kid my mom used to make fun of my brother and I we would watch the OC I know that's a very girly show and it's even girlier to admit that and this is because I watched it back then I haven't watched it in years but to be honest because this is a podcast about honesty I do own all three seasons. Um, I haven't watched them. God, it was only three seasons. That was... A, I I just didn't like... I didn't know how to talk to girls. So I thought if I watched the show, I'd have something to talk to them about. Turns out, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just assumed that if you worked on those shows, you'd be set. And to see that guy 
working at the Apple store freaked me out. And I was like, I'll never like have something to do like that. Now I'm living with my parents at 32. So it happens. Be care- young, young people be care. This is the ghost of, of Hanukkah f- future. Yeah. I guess, I, I guess I'm, I don't know. I'm the ghost of Hanukkah here to tell you to stay, stay in school and, and go get a degree in, in, in building apps or something. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was just, it, I just remember it really freaking me out. And then I got to LA and I had, like I said, I had a great job at America's Funny Some Videos and I, I had some jobs at really shitty places. Like one, one, one time my, like my second job in LA was on a show where they like faked catching, uh, shoplifters. Like I found out later, it was all staged. Um, I, and and the thing that really upset me on that one was my boss was a, like younger than me and had like no idea what he was doing. Like I've quit. I I think I quit two jobs because it was just so. I had I worked for like I said I worked for Vindabona and America's Funniest and Hell's Kitchen. I worked for some great people, but there's the thing about L.A is and we'll talk more about this later it also attracts like scum and and maybe I'm part scum but I'm not full scum and like this kid I I just I kept getting in trouble and because he just didn't know how to what to tell me to do I was my it was my like second or third job out of, in LA and there's something that you're supposed to do when when you have all these when you, when there's multiple cameras the, basically, the assistant editor's full job is to uh, sync all the cameras together so the editors can, uh, what's it called, can edit all at once without having to like find this exact spot. Um, it's called syncing. And syncing and grouping. Um, and he didn't know what, he didn't know how to do it, so he's trying to teach me. And the worst part is, like, this is why to this day I don't like GoPros because they're so hard to do this with because they don't have any time code and they have terrible microphones. And well, who knows, maybe now they fixed it, but eight years ago they didn't. Um, and I ended up quitting because I was just so, it was such a, like I, I, it's such a negative feeling when you go, when you wake up for work, and you're like, ah, oh. and it's, I was working nights. So I'd wake up and then I'd be like, I have three hours until I have to leave two hours until, and it was just, it was just a bummer, and the, and the funny thing is, is part of LA is such, um, and this will get to the second part, is such a, it's all about image, so there's, this show was, the, the offices were at a place called Sunset and Gower, it's a studio, and I only saw one part so, and it wasn't like, like a crack house, but I had never, like, I never worked on Paramount. I never weren't working at Universal. When you hear studio lot, you're like, I am a big baller now. And I, I should have known that it wasn't going to work out because I worked there for a few months, I think. And every time I went in, they never got my parking. Like every time the the guard had to call in, like, is Lee allowed to be here? He shouldn't be here, right? Um, and they finally let me in, and it was just when you I just said like when you imagine studios, when you imagine Paramount, you imagine just heaven, like Tom Cruise walking around, Brad Pitt. They have like the nicest cars, it was like 1980s, 1990s, and it was in the 2012, 2013, it was, it was so old and so run down, I thought it was going to be the coolest thing, and the offices were just stinky, it was just terrible, and, um, and the other funny thing, and this is the next thing I wanted to, to mention, was, uh, I, I told you I met Dr. Cox, or I didn't meet him, I saw him. My boss at that, and one of the places I won't name, uh, 
or I can't name. I I probably I think I did sign an NDA, so I really can't tell you too much. Um, I, who cares? But uh, he came in, and we knew he was coming in to do some uh, voiceovers. And I remember my boss at the time. He told me he was like, "Don't look him in the eye." It's like, what do you? I I thought it was a joke. I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Listen, he's here to work. Just don't bother him." Don't just if you if you if you if you run into him, just walk away. Like he, they literally told me, "Don't look him in the eye." And then of course he came in and said hi and was super nice and and had no idea that anyone else had uh <laughs> had uh like asked or said anything about that. But people just make up weird rules in L.A. Like they just do stuff. To do stuff, I don't. I, I don't know if it makes them feel more important or what, but it was. It was just like I. I had to do some weird stuff at some of my jobs. One time, at one of my first jobs, uh, they had. I was a PA then. I wasn't even assistant editor. Well, I think I. I think my title was assistant editor, but I was basically a PA, which is production assistant, which means uh, bitch, basically. Um, and they were uh, giving cameras out to production to go shoot in the field. And they had these bo- these camera boxes. And they had, like, the labels on them from, like, the last shoot. So they gave me a butter knife from the office and a thing of goo gone and said, get to work, fatty. Um, <laughs> and uh, they didn't say that. But I just remember, like, I, I had just, like, in the last year or two started paying my student loans. So I, I was, you know, paying student loans every month and I was literally scraping labels off with Goo Gone and a butter knife. And I was like, this is not like the land of milk and honey and dreams that I was told it was. Um, yeah, God, that still makes me angry. Uh, and the other funny thing is, even though it's all about image there, they also don't. How do I want to put this? It's like they want to seem cool and like they don't they don't really care in a weird way. I never I never once and this is in LA, but I right literally actually right after I met Joey, I think I'd done like one or two videos with him. Uh I got an interview at UFC, at the UFC headquarters. And this relates to what I'm about to tell you. I was really excited. Uh, I wasn't even, I was, I was a, I had just started being a fan, but I wasn't like a huge fan at that point, but it was a, it's a big company and I, I like Vegas and I thought it'd be really cool. So I remember I drove out for the interview and I had not even a full suit, but I had like the suit pants and a button down shirt and shoes and I had hung them up and I, I even changed in the parking lot. I don't even know if I changed in their parking lot or if I went to like a different parking lot before. I don't even know if I did, to be honest, if I, I might have been their parking lot. They, they probably saw, I just I'm realizing this now that they probably saw me change. That's so, so weird. Um, but I I didn't want to wrinkle anything. But I knew better. I looking back, it was also one of my first jobs. Uh, or after one of my first jobs. Um. So I wasn't super uh, experienced yet, which could have been the reason they didn't hire me, but. In my head, the reason why they didn't hire me, and I'll explain this more in a second, is because I wore fancy clothing. Like, the people interviewing me weren't dressed up. They didn't look like slobs, but they weren't dressed up at all. And I remember, I felt, I felt I, looking back, my mom, I think it's funny and just shows what L.A. is like. My mom thinks it's, a, like, she feels bad for the poor kid. I remember one of my jobs, I'd been working there for a while, and someone came in for an interview wearing a suit, which you might be like, well, why is that funny? In LA, and not everybody, there are, like I worked for some realtors uh, for some podcast stuff. Danny, actually, yeah, Danny, you know him. He was on this podcast. He would wear nice stuff. Um, he would dress up nice, and but not even always. He would like medium dress up, like business casual. And I, he, I'm sure he wore suits sometimes. But the richer the person in LA... They definitely didn't wear a suit, and no one in post production or really production, even yeah, no one in yeah, 
Even the lawyers, I don't think, wore suits. They, it's, it's a jeans and a polo max. And even then, like I remember uh, multiple times, uh, my buddy Matt and I would go into the office and we would, uh, like, they, there'd be underwear in the jeans and our in the jean leg from, like, the day before. And it was just, like, I just remember this poor kid came in in a suit and after he left, everyone, went, like, even the person who interviewed him just laughed, was laughing. Like, can you believe that guy? Like, it's a very strange place. And also, by the way, I don't know if this is just uh, production, entertainment, or all of, all of L.A., but people party there in the offices. Like, I saw people, uh, like, it, like, the minimum was, because you get an hour for lunch. I don't know who needs an hour for lunch. Um, and mo- and usually people would kind of turn that into an hour and a half. It was normal to, like, go out and get drunk. Like, actually, Matt, um, I, I forget what birthday it was. One of my first birthdays in L.A., he was really nice. I was working nights at the time, and he was working days. And I ended up taking my lunch right when I got there, pretty much. And he, he took me to a place, forget the name of it. It was a, pl- a bar on Pico, and they had something. It they gave you a shot, a PBR, and the, a cigarette. I don't I don't smoke cigarettes, but I just remember that being like a combo they had. And uh, I don't remember the name of the bar. I was gonna say something, but I I was gonna say Liquid Kitty, but I think that's up in the valley. Um, it doesn't matter where it was. But yeah, getting hammered at lunch was a huge thing. Drink. Uh, I used to when I worked nights. I used to have to go around and make sure that the editing base were. I didn't have to clean them, but um, like cups. They they the, my boss asked me to make sure no cups were in there, and it turned into a joke with me because every coffee mug I found was full of wine. It was it was, to be honest, hysterical. Um, and like I saw people crush, I didn't even know you could snort pills, but I saw people take a coffee mug and crush a pill and snort it. And I was the biggest dork in the world and had no idea any of this was even happening in in the world, but it, it was happening in LA. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that I mean, and I remember because the, the reason it, it, it sparked that is they used to, I don't even think they do it anymore, but they had uh, end of the year parties or end of not sorry, not end of the year, end of season parties. And they had it at a couple of the di- of different shows I worked on. And they had open bar when I first got there. And I, the one time, the Hell's Kitchen after party or season ending party, it was actually going on and we were still working. So we actually had to go back to work after. And I remember my my boss didn't get mad because he was a cool guy, but I remember like, because they have they have people. It's called a post either coordinator or supervisor. I don't know if he was a coordinator or supervisor, but um, he he came and talked. He's like, Lee, you gotta cal- calm down because I was I wasn't like blackout drunk, like belligerent, but I was when I drink, I have a good time. Like I I giggle, I I high five people. And I remember we got back to the office. I didn't drive. But I remember we got back to the office and I was hammered drunk, just hammered. And then, oh, this was actually really, this is actually really nice. Um, At Hell's Kitchen one night, and this is, there's a funny story to it. Uh, We did, Joey and I did one live podcast at uh, Meltdown. I don't even know, I think it's probably up there. Yeah, I don't think it's a secret, no. Um, but we did a pod, one live podcast at Meltdown Comics. And we took edibles, as always. But I was still, that was still in the early, like, way before. You know what, maybe it's not up there because Stickham got taken down. Yeah, it's probably not. Uh, the audio is probably there. Um, but we took edibles, but I was still working at Hell's Kitchen. So I, I got to work and I was stoned and I was just kind of hiding in my edit bay. I was doing some work, but like I wasn't being very social because I was stoned out of my mind. 
and for some, I still, I miss these people, and I haven't spoken to them in years, just because you lose touch, but, um, they threw me an on, they called it an unbirthday party, it was nowhere near my birthday, I don't remember even what month it was, um, maybe it was in like February or March, because I think I ended that show in April, or December, it was some, somewhere around there, it's hard to tell in LA, because it's the same temperature all the time, but, uh, they like surprised me and like they put a cupcake in my face and they had like dollar store gifts. It was one of the funniest, nicest things actually that's ever happened to me. It was actually really fun. Um, you should do that. Throw a, like, an unbirthday party for someone nowhere near their birthday. And it was just, but they they had no idea that it was, you know, now guys, uh, that I was stoned out of my mind. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Here. Oh, so the next thing, that I, I, I thought was really, uh, this was actually a good one, is um, I told you about the new Beverly Cinema at the beginning. And if you don't know, it's, uh, it's it's I think it's called a revival theater. It's a one theater place. They don't have like, it's not a multiplex. They have one theater and they just redid it. I haven't been there since they've redone it, unfortunately. But, it used to cost like five or six bucks for a double feature. I actually, the time I'm going to tell you about was a triple feature. Same price. They have amazing, like, because I worked at a movie theater in high school and college. And they would like pre-pop popcorn. It was shitty popcorn. This was like good, legit popcorn. They had hot dogs. They had, and like, they had like old trailers for all the movies. And... They really cared about movies. I remember once, I just, I was, I, you guys won't be able to see it. I was, uh, I had a flip phone, and I just took it out of my pocket and just hit the light on the front screen to see what time it was, and someone immediately came and, like I said, no phones, um, which I, I, I respect. But um, it was the first time I was there, and Quentin Tarantino at the time owned a part of it. Now he owns the whole thing. But David Carradine, the actor, had just passed away. I think he was in Kill Bill. I know a a Carradine was in Kill Bill, so I'm almost positive it was him. Um, He had just passed away, and they were doing a David Carradine triple feature. I don't remember the movies. I remember one was like a, a Western, I think. And I heard Quentin Tarantino laugh. I just, I someone had told me about it. I, I didn't I wasn't a David Carradine fan, but someone told me how awesome it was and I went to go check it out by myself. And like and this was now you can buy tickets online on uh, brown paper tickets, I think. At least that's what it used to be. But when I first started, you had to like line up and buy tickets in person. And they would just give you like uh, like a raffle ticket. It wasn't like even a real ticket. So during the first movie I heard Tarantino laugh. And the way the theater set up is they have a big center section and at least a section on the right, and they also might have a section on the left. It's been a while since I've been there, but I think they had a section on the both sides. Definitely on the right. Um, and I, that's where I was sitting. I was sitting on the right. And I looked behind me, and like five or ten rows up, it was Tarantino. It was Quentin. And it was like my first big L.A. celebrity sighting. And... I loved Quentin Tarantino's movies. I know some people are going to say he steals stuff. I don't know anything about that. I liked his movies. Um, and he's a very distinct, full, distinct laugh. And I, so like I said, it was a triple feature. So all during the first, this is why I don't remember what movies were playing. All during the rest of the first movie, I was just trying to psych myself up to go talk to him. And I was the type of person, like, I would get starstruck by people in the news. This was years before the church. I don't think I even knew Joey at this point. Um, and between the first and the second movie, I couldn't do it. Some people did. Went and talked to him. I, I didn't. And then between the second and the third, I got the balls somehow. And I went up, and I literally, I didn't make a fool out of myself, but I kind of did. I went up, and I could barely speak. And I was like, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I just moved here, and it's because of you. And like, I didn't want to be a director, but I just, I liked his his editor. I believe her name was Sally Menke, uh, who has since passed away, unfortunately. Um, but 
he was very generous and very nice. So oh, thank you. And, and um, I think that was about, I don't think we even had a, a conversation beyond that, but it was like, it, I was more nervous about that than I am about stand up in a way. I don't know about more, but just as nervous. And it was, uh, that was like my first big, probably my biggest overall. And, uh, with the church, I don't know if I can say that. Quentin's pretty big. It's close. Even with the church. Um, it's one of the biggest celebrities I, I met out there or saw. And it was, it was uh, God, if you, if you're ever in LA, the, the new Beverly is a place to be. Unfortunately, they closed for like a year to renovate. And then it was open for like six months and then COVID hit. So I didn't get to see it again. Um, and I, but if I ever go back to LA for a visit, I'll absolutely go one night. Um, now there's some, there's some funny ones and some like annoying things. It's like I said, it's a LA attracts some weirdos and some less than scrupulous people. And one of the things that people like to do is I like to, like when I was um, applying for jobs, it always the term they always put in the ad was rock star assistant editor. But they they would pay like nothing. And the thing about LA is, uh, or this industry is you don't, other than Vin Debona for America's Funniest Home Videos, and even there it's kind of different, you have jobs for seasons or for projects. So if it's like a, a series, yeah, you might get hired for the season. They can always fire you whenever they want. One of the shows I worked on went through like 50 editors. It was embarrassing. Um, not 50, but at least 20. Um, but... It's not like you get a job and then it's just your job. Every few months you're looking for a new job. And so I just got used to that and looking at, at postings and sending in resumes and stuff like that. And uh, and I have a good story about it too. But one time I, I had, there's actually two I'll tell you about. I Once I, I had a phone interview with the World Poker Tour. And... It's a big show. You see it on ESPN all the time. And they wanted to offer. I don't know if I should put out the exact number. It's, it was under a thousand a week. Which. For that job. Is very low. Uh, yeah. And it's and, here, and here's the special. Because I've made under that. I made like. 800 bucks maybe. To start a week. Which is fine. It's not terrible, but it's not. I mean, it's not great, especially to live in L.A. But the reason why it, it stood out to me now, I'm remembering, is they were part of the union, and that's like the big thing. I actually, I went to a meeting. I could have joined the union, which would have been a ton of money. So, like for example, and this has probably changed. The rate for a, a union assistant editor started at eighteen seventy five a week. Uh, I never made that. I'll, t- I'll just tell you what I made uh, next, but so to go from eighteen seventy five to under, I was under nine. I'll say that, and it was like it's just funny. Like you see it on ESPN, you think they have a ton of they're gonna. It's a big show, and I I hope I don't. It was an interview. I never worked for you, so I didn't sign anything. Um, and they were they weren't they weren't mean. They just it, w- it was a low offer, but like they it was classified as like low budget which I don't know how that's possible. Maybe they just got lucky and had a low budget show that that uh <laughs> that was like on ESPN. But it was just it was wild. But one of the uh, other to to be a positive about it it was right after the bad jo- the job I was telling you about earlier on uh, the studio lot with the kid who was younger than me and didn't know what he was doing. Um, I'm sure you can do now, um, but I I uh, quit that job and I was gonna go back to work for America's Funniest Home Videos and I did actually for a week because I said I would, but I I remember I I literally just quit and I was getting lunch, uh, or dinner I guess on my like one of my last days at the office, and I got a call from a guy with the coolest name ever named Laszlo. And he was he worked for Hell's Kitchen. He said, "Hi, this is my name is Laszlo. Uh, 
I got your resume, and I didn't apply to Hell's Kitchen. Someone I still to this day have no idea who sent in my resume, um, and I was not qualified to work there. But he said, uh, "Would you be interested in coming to to work on Hell's Kitchen?" And I said, uh, "Of course." And he said, "Now I'm sorry." And listen, I was making under a thousand dollars a week at this point. He called. He said, "Listen, I'm I'm very sorry, but the most I can offer you is twelve fifty a week." And I, I almost shit my pants. I and and some of you might be saying that's a lot of money. It's it's definitely not a bad living, um, but I was like a year or two at most, a year and a half out of college. And twelve fifty to go from under a thousand to oh to twelve fifty a week was like the coolest thing. I I and I I played it cool. I was like, yeah, I think I can make that work. But I, inside, I was like doing a Jewish dance. Like this is the best day of my life. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Whoever out there gave them my resume, thank you. So that like I said, as 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 in, much as I'm not a fan of LA, there are some good people who work there. And that really helped me out. It was one of the biggest shows I worked on. One of the two between that and America's Funniest Home Videos. One of the two most successful shows of all time. Um, but I, I did also go, God, similar to the uh, WPT job, which I probably shouldn't have told you about the name, but it doesn't matter. Um, what are you going to sue? I have nothing. What are you going to sue me for? Um, I got interviewed for a show on Animal Planet, and it wasn't Animal Planet. I shouldn't be saying all these names. It wasn't an Animal Planet production. It was a production company did the show for them. And it like you learn that people try to take advantage of you in L.A. So I, I was an interview for a job there, and they were telling me, and they are like, okay, just so you know, uh, here's the rate, and the rate was fine. And they were like, okay, but just so you know, this is for a six-day week. But we almost never have you do it. And it's I, I at that point I'd been burned a couple times and I was like, you know, I don't think that's really gonna work for me because and I just know when they say we never have we almost never have you work that six day, that means they always have you make that work that six day. So, um that's one piece of advice for anyone moving to LA. And this is it, it stinks that I'm about to say this, but you kinda have to uh work under the assumption that someone's trying to take advantage of you, which, which uh, kind of leads me to my, it does lead me to my next one. I went on, not as much as Joey. Joey had, had a lot more experience with this than I did, but it happened to me a few times is that like people will take you to lunch, which is nice. It's not who, Hey, who am I to say no to a free lunch? But uh, I don't think I've ever turned down a free freaking roll before, but they, it's like they love doing, they love offering you a, let, let me buy you lunch. And like three or four times I got taken out to lunch and, and sh you're amazing. You're great. We'd love to have you work on this project and we're going to pay you. You can't believe what we're going to pay you. And either a, they just, it's, it's worse than Tinder. Like they just stop calling you or B, they'll still talk to you, but like you'll be like, hey, what happened with that with that show you wanted me to work on? Oh, uh, we uh, we lost funding, or, or what? And it's it's just, it, it, and no one there has any sort of uh, class. I'm not gonna say nobody. A lot of people have no class, and I guess that's that's a universal thing. Um, but it it's it's just it, it got old. Where like you would just meet these people who they're just they're good salesmen. That's it. Like and and maybe sometimes this happened where you'd go to work for somebody and then they just they would say, oh, we're going to pay you this. We're going to do this for you. They wouldn't pay you. I felt bad. There was this one person I got a job on a on a show that I couldn't do, but I, I was still helping out with. And after like two weeks, I could see that they were scam artists. Um, and so I left and I told the person who I got the job, listen, you should leave too, but they didn't. And they ended up not paying that person like $10,000 or something. 
And it's just, it's, you really have to, I, I said on last week's show um, that my mom asked me if I had anyone I could trust in LA and very few. And it's, uh, it's something that I said about Joey for years and it's, uh, it's, uh, the, I thought it was going to hurt his feelings at first, but it just didn't. He loved it. He said, I, and it's just the truth. My most, and like I said, Vin Bona was great. Hell's Kitchen was great. But for like, I'm talking about clients. I said my most professional client was a, a, a f- like a, an ex-convict who went to jail for, for uh, kidna- I almost said murdering. He didn't murder anybody. Uh, for kidnapping somebody with a machine gun. And that shows you really like the the uh, level of people you're dealing with in LA. And uh, it's just, there's just so many of them. And so just be careful if you're ever in the entertainment industry or in LA, who, I don't know. I, I don't have experience in New York, but I would imagine it might be similar. Um, but the, the, the last one that I, that is, was sort of closed out my time in LA still makes me laugh. So my last year or two in LA, I was doing stand up, and I, uh, I, Joey had been telling me for a while to, to try to get in commercials. So I went and I took a commercial acting class, like four Saturdays for like three or four hours a day. And I, I took it and I, I posted myself on, they have, they have websites where you can like self submit to get auditions. And I got a message one day. Uh, we, I, I'm so-and-so of the such and such agency, not one of the big ones. It's not like CAA or anything, but an agency. And they're like, we would love to have you come in. And like, we'd like to talk about representing you. And I thought I'd made it. I thought I was going to be a star. And, um, and I went in and as I was sitting there and this will make sense, there was another person in there before me and I go in and she, it was, she was a little person. I was like, okay. So I go in and, and we're talking and he represented somebody in a Marvel movie and they wanted to not only represent me for for commercials but also for for uh theatrical, that's what it's called. And this is this is the line that I'll never forget till the day I die. He looked at me and goes, You know, the only other fat guy I have is a redhead and it scares people. I think I can make a lot of money with you. <laughs> and I realized, like, that's not a joke. Like, the only other fat guy I have is a redhead. And I, I realized at that moment that he, like, specialized in, like, I guess the nice way to put it would be, like, characters. Because I was the fat guy. There was the little person. I don't know what he had. A three-armed person, too. I don't know what he had. But, um... The weird thing is, is like I like I like I just said, people come in and they they say, "Oh, we're gonna do so much with you." He got me like two audit. He got me more auditions after I left LA than he ever got me when I was in LA. But he like disappeared for like six months. I was like, I guess I don't have an agent anymore. I would call him, leave him messages, emails, nothing, and then he just showed up again and and sent me out. I I went on like two auditions. Didn't obviously didn't get it, um, but it was just. I'll never forget that. The only other fat guy I have is a redhead, and he scares people. So, if you're thinking about moving to L.A. to be an actor and to to live the glamorous life, get ready, get ready. Let's hope you're not a redhead. Um, but that's it, you guys. That's uh, like I said, it's gonna be. I it's I guess it's not that short, but it's a shorter episode this week. I just wanted to make sure you guys had something while I was away. And next week, uh, I will be back in a different shirt, uh, back from my trip to Milwaukee. Uh, also, don't forget that I do every Thursday. I have uh, Church of What's Happening Now reaction videos that I put up on my YouTube channel. So go check those out. And uh, very quickly at the end, I just wanted to remind you, uh, to go to manscaped.com and use code SCIENT to get 20% off plus free shipping. And when, while you're there, check out the new Ultra Smooth Package. has everything that you need from the uh, Crop Exfoliator, the Crop Gel, and uh, let me look. I'm sorry, the Crop Shaver. Um, 
It has everything that you need to have your balls looking just smooth and beautiful. And trust me, it's 2021 and you want to have good-looking balls. So go to manscaped.com and use code SIAT to get 20% off plus free shipping. Smooth it out, fellas, with Manscaped. Your balls and Lee will thank you. Thank you guys very much for watching this week's What Was I Thinking? And I will be back next Monday. Bye, guys.